Hello, and welcome to another edition of Academic Matters. I'm Joe Marbach, the provost at LaSalle University. In this segment, I'm joined by Dr. David George, a professor in our Department of Economics. David, welcome to the program. Thank you. Uh, for folks at home who may not be aware of your uh, career here at LaSalle, can you give us a little bit of your background and uh, how you ended up at LaSalle? Yes, I was uh, originally a psychology major at, uh, I'm from Michigan, I went to the University of Michigan and was planning to go into psychology, but I uh, came up with some ideas about uh, consumption in the marketplace and if markets uh, mislead us, et cetera. It had a psychology dimension to it, but I thought economics was the way to go. I came to Philadelphia because I love the city and I went to Penn for a master's and went over to Temple for a doctorate and uh, then I happened to stumble in a rather unusual way in, into LaSalle. Uh, I'm very happy I did. Uh, uh, Joseph Flubacher uh, had read one little paper I wrote, which was from the former Catholic Economic Association journal. And so when I applied as an adjunct, he recognized me and I've been here ever since. Oh, okay. And Flubacher so was a legendary chair oh, yes. of, of economics yeah, for yeah. many years. I, I avoided the torture of, of going through millions of applications. So this was your first and only position? Yes, full-time position, and I'm very happy. Um, what's changed at LaSalle? You've been here 35 years? Yeah. What's changed over that time? Um, and why was it the place? Why did you know this was the fit when you got here? Well, the, fir the first thing I wanted was a small, a relatively small school. I wanted a school where I would not, I could do my research, but not feel intense pressure or direction in the kind of research. Uh, Catholic social thought from a, a, a liberal direction, mm -hmm. a good part of it, was very attractive to me. Uh, I didn't even know it originally, but as I did my work, I saw the connections. And so this was just a very good place, I think. And I'm, the more I look it back, I'm, I couldn't have imagined a better kind of a, of a place to be for me. Mm -hmm. The pressure at a, uh, at a PhD institution would be something I really sought. Yeah, we would be publish or perish, so if you yeah, yeah, crank out next right. number of books or articles. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. How's the institution changed? Oh, I didn't, yeah. Um, you know, uh, to be honest, I don't observe that as much, which is a, can be a good thing. Now, I've been in the same building, and we've stayed pretty much the same, same offices and that. But, um, I mean, clearly, uh, one thing is very uh, noticeable is the more diverse student uh, population. Mm. It was... Uh, uh, I don't know what percent was Catholic and what percent not, but it was uh, very strongly Irish Catholic, uh, very strong, uh, and I don't see that nearly as much. I see a very uh, mixed uh, student body. This is happening, I think, everywhere, mm -hmm. and uh, it's uh, so it's more international. Yeah, of course, with the building and all that's uh, changed. Yeah, it's expanded quite a bit. Yeah. So I guess our our demographics have reflected kind of the changing demographics in the Philadelphia region, yeah. which is our principal uh, markets where we draw our students from? I've seen, um, of, of course, uh, with faculty, I believe that more of us are researchers now, but that's very understandable. There used to be more teaching. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, as I say, I always use my summers for my research. And, uh, uh, but it's, uh, like I say, it's been a very, uh, a very, uh, I don't want to say unpressured, but I, I don't believe in too much pressure in life where you feel like you're going to lose your job the next day or something. So it's been a very good place to be all these okay. years. Yeah. You mentioned you use the summers to do your research. Uh, tell us a little bit about it, because it's not traditional economics. That's right. Um, and there's a <laughs> social justice component right. in, in what you do. Well, I, I got into it, uh, as I said, I was a psychology major, and I uh, was trying to understand how I would go to McDonald's restaurants all the time, yet at the same time criticize them. I was saying, am I, am I a hypocrite? I was, 60 students saying all these fast food. Uh, then I said, well, I know why. I, 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 want to, I want that food, but I wish I didn't want it. And that was the starting point. The fact that we may have desires about our desires. And then I explored how uh, the market was in, in, uh, in responding to that. And so I saw certain market failures, as we say, mm. in that realm, in the shaping of us. Um, that's how I got into it. Economics and is it is it the notion that corporations were exploiting those market failures well, uh, or it, 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 
or is it just explaining human behavior? It's, it's explaining human behavior, but it's explaining also belief systems. And, and uh, the Western notions of freedom are quite honestly uh, too narrow. I mean, the Catholic Church understands it. Quite. <laughs> that's what I found out. I mean, uh, so, you know, we figure, well, I give somebody what they want to buy. I guess that's what I should give them. But sometimes it's not. I mean, we know that with drugs, certainly. Uh, but so there, there wasn't, uh, it was difficult for those who had some standards to stay with them if it wasn't going to work in the marketplace. That was my fear. And it wasn't a conspiracy. It was, it was a shared uh, belief system that I tried to do what I can to. Okay. So instead of a, a free market where anything goes, it's more of, how would you describe it? A, well, you, you mean as far as what I would want to see? Yeah. Well, I, I think some of it, I mean, we always need government for a lot of market uh, shortcomings. But a lot of it, I realize, uh, can arise from different understandings. I mean, I think somebody feels that they're being maybe self-righteous or, or too paternalistic if they say, I won't sell this, uh, this bad food to my customer. But because you're told, well, they want it, that's what I'm supposed to give them. Well, I would say no. It means if you, it, many times you're doing a good thing by trying to uh, be a guide, each of us being a guide to everybody else, given our specialties and our knowledge. So. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, I, many years ago, we had the economist Walter Williams on campus. Oh, yes. Who was talking <laughs> about free markets, and I, 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 I had the opportunity to ask him a question about how do you explain market shortcomings or market failure? And his response was, well, I don't believe in such a thing. We probably, re we probably defined the market incorrectly. Yes. Which I thought was well, semantics um, around uh, getting what were truly market failures, but I was wondering how uh, your thoughts would. Well, uh, see what many say, and in fact, I did a paper on this. Uh, many follow a, 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 this, this idea, they say, if the market has survived and there's no corrections for failures, it must be that it's not worth it. That is to say, and it's true, sometimes we can't correct for certain kinds of, I don't deny that, but I know Walter Williams, an extreme libertarian, uh, almost sees any collective action, democratic, uh, is, is an intrusion. It's a very extreme libertarian position that unless you decide you agree to everything. There's no right you being told what to do, even if you voted that government in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he had a rather extreme uh, position there, I think. So quite to the opposite. Oh yes. Where where you might be. Yeah. Okay. David, tell me about your students and your work with your students, and um, you know what kind of research are the students doing, and, and how do you engage them and encourage them to to conduct research? Now, um, with the majors, I. Uh, have had a more limited role there. We've only been, economics being a very difficult subject, there's not a lot of research until the senior seminar that one can do. So when I assign papers, they tend not, they tend to be exploratory. I, I try to, uh, I, I, how can I put it? I don't, uh, except for the rare student, uh, truly original research is not where they can be yet. Mm -hmm. And I also uh, very much like teaching uh, the principles to non-majors, the principles of economics introductory. I've always loved it. And I like teaching people who aren't going to be economists to at least, so that's really what I, I most do. When I've taught our majors, it's been intermediate uh, theory and uh, economic history and history of economic thought and so on. Uh, but there, there hasn't been as much as uh, we're now trying to institute in the way of uh, student research. I've done some, but not, not a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, when you talk about doing the, the history of economic thought, are there misconceptions that students bring into the yes. classroom? Um, and and w what's the most prevalent one, if, if one comes to mind? What do students well, think they know that they, they don't really know? Well, the sad fact is, uh, it's true of most uh, sciences, uh, social sciences more so than natural sciences, I think it is, that they don't respect their history quite enough. In some of the natural sciences, it's a curiosity. We've made progress. We now know what they didn't know then. In economics, it's not that way. It's, it's back and forth over many uh, you know, centuries. And we make some progress, but we also change opinion. And, and so I think the students are shocked to see how philosophical the subject was and, and, uh, and political. Hmm. It was once political economy. And so uh, I think they get much from it. I have no doubt that it's very uh, 
very needed, although it's a threatened course right now around mm -hmm. the country. The first to go are the humanities sometimes. Sometimes we're, we're trying to prevent that. I know, that. We, uh, here we, we're at LaSalle. Yeah. Um, David, you, you announced that you're going to be uh, retiring at, yes. in, in May. Mm -hmm. um, what's next then? What, I can't imagine that you're no, going to be hitting the golf course or no. uh, <laughs> sunny Florida. What, what, uh, what do you have planned? A book, another book. Uh, and this one, I, uh, it's, it, I don't know if it's going to be a trade book or a wider readership, but I, for years, have been uh, noting connections between the movement towards economic conservatism from the time of Ronald Reagan, and at the same time, uh, social liberalism, including feminism and the civil rights movement and the gay rights movement. Uh, what I'm detecting is that it's not a coincidence that we've gone so much more uh, towards conservative economics at the same time that we're liberal on social issues. Because as I'm reading it, they're part of a piece not to say I, I'm very much for gay rights and women's equality and God help me, social justice for African Americans, but I'm seeing how uh, we're having a harder time being sympathetic for um, the unsuccessful today because we used to know, well, the, the person's poor because they're African American or because they're, they're, there's discrimination against them. So we were, I thought, think, more thoughtful, strangely enough. Right now, those at the bottom are said to deserve it because everybody now is supposed to have a chance and if you don't go with it so that's kind of where i'm going here so where do the the social movements come out of them is that the groups defending themselves or I, well i th i think that the criterion for success in um among african americans in general and and uh, women's uh, groups in general women uh, has been economic success fairly uh defined rather conservative so I, I haven't seen a, a, an increased interest in social justice of a broader nature. Now, each group has a very important issue, of course. They have to be most concerned with dignity and, and fair treatment for women or gays or whoever we're talking about. But I don't think that they've, uh, you know, we've had a loss of unions. We've had a loss of social welfare programs at the same time that these uh, various groups have had success. Okay. Well, David, good luck with that work. Thank you. First time okay. I've talked about it. All right. Yeah. My guest has been Professor David George of the Department of Economics. Uh, please come back after these messages when I'll be joined by Jack Zook from our accounting department. Thank you. All right. Thank you.
Hello, welcome back to Academic Matters. Once again, I'm Joe Marbach, the Provost at LaSalle University. In this segment, I'm joined by Jack Zook, who is a professor in the accounting department. Jack, welcome to the program. Thank you, Joe, glad to be here. Uh, we were just chatting about how long you've been at LaSalle. Um, tell me a little bit about your background and, and how you ended up here, right. and I guess why you've stayed so long. Right, well that's a good question. It is a long time, it's, this is my end of 39th year. I was an undergraduate degree in mathematics and a graduate degree in finance, and I went to work for Coopers and Library, which is now Price Waterhouse Coopers. And while I was there, they made a phone call one day to the personnel department and said they needed someone to teach one accounting course at LaSalle. And I came to LaSalle and met with Joe Mar Markman, who was the chair, and he hired me as an adjunct and then ultimately as a full-time professor, and that was 1975. Okay. So you taught that one class and then got the, well, the I, I teaching loved bug? It. Absolutely loved it. Always wanted to do it. It's been the most rewarding thing I've done professionally in my life is to teach, and, and teach at LaSalle has been great. Okay. And you were, you were mentioning that uh, you teach a financial literacy course or financial? Fin personal financial personal planning. planning. And, and I teach the undergraduate tax courses and then personal financial planning, a course that I developed about 10 years ago. And it takes the, the essence of taxes, applies it to financial planning, and provides the students with an opportunity to do their own financial plan, which is their second, the big paper they have to do and case study at the end of the semester for the next 10 years. Do their financial plan, plan how they're gonna save for retirement, plan how, where they're gonna invest in, plan how they're gonna buy a house, how they're gonna structure it, how they're going to come up with the, the money down, where they're gonna, the, the investment horizons. And so we go through all of that so they have a comprehensive understanding when they graduate. Something that every every college graduate would probably have. Yeah, really, and we're, we're taping this uh, in the first week of April, so uh, <laughs> April 15th is, is right around the corner, so. Absolutely. Uh, uh, I guess you're pretty busy these days. Uh, to some degree, yes, to some degree. Um, Jack, you're working with the students. Um, what level of financial literacy do you find? Are they coming in informed or? Well, I'm dealing with business majors primarily, mm -hmm. and they, are, they have had courses in finance and accounting and, and tax if they get into the course I teach. Uh, but I think that the majority are, are just not aware of what has to happen out there. And, and the most important thing, Joe, is that they delay too long in saving for retirement. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the whole shift in, in the economy has been to a defined contribution plan versus defined benefit. Therefore, you're responsible. You're self-directing your own retirement. If you don't start early enough, the compounding effect I I I that you lose is, is significant dollars. So I think uh, if for the majority of Americans, 60, 70% are, are probably improperly funded, uh, un insufficient funding mm. for retirement. So I'm trying to stress that at, at an early level. And I guess in those changes, are, are corporations still contributing to retirement funds or has there been less of that? And they contribute, but they contribute a percentage. Uh, and uh, as uh, defined contribution as opposed to of, of salary versus defined benefit, which says when you retire, Joe, you're going to get this for the rest of your life. Those, those plans are, are, are dinosaurs and about only about 8% of corporations have them versus 60% in 30 years ago. Okay. And I guess that's been the issue that we've seen with a lot of state and local governments that have the defined benefit plan. Exactly. And they've underfunded those pension plans. Significantly, and it's a problem. And the promises that were made, but almost impossible to keep. And uh, they're, they're, they're slowly running into the same problem that General Motors ran into and the, the automakers. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so Jack, to what extent do you bring those kinds of real world circumstances into the classroom? Because you're, you're really talking about life lessons in addition to right. knowing yes. how the numbers work out. Right, well I've done that in all the courses I've taught because I've, I was an auditor at, at, Price, at Cooper's Library at Price Waterhouse. Uh, I have, we have a CPA firm that I'm involved with and I do tax work and tax planning and financial planning. So I will take a client, redact the information, come in, s explain the circumstances and show them how this could be more effective and how you can mitigate the tax effect legally and then and how to to increase the wealth and everybody should be into wealth retention not in the sense that you're going to be ultra wealthy just so that you can retire comfortably and be able to afford afford health care towards the end of your life which is which is what i'm writing an article on right now it's very expensive and uh, people have to be prepared for that yeah and i i guess if some of our viewers are aware of any of the uh commercials that have been out about how long your retirement savings right. will last you and yes. they take these tape measures and they come up short. Uh, exactly. Uh, I guess with people's lifespans too, they're living longer. Yes. People are working longer too. Uh, the, I just, it's fun, uh, this is an article I'm writing on the cost of, of retirement uh, and most of the, of the 
uh, advertising and articles are on accumulating wealth, which is what those, uh, what those articles are about, driven, mm -hmm. and then the, how long do you need to distribute. But when you look at the, the, the average American retires at age 61, and, the, and I just have data from the Society of Actuaries that if, if you have a married couple at age 65, they have like a 40% chance one of them will live to be 95. So you have, you have a 30 plus year uh, a time frame that you're gonna have no active income and you have to live and it's gonna get more costly, especially the last 10 years of that, of that 30 year uh, uh, potential period of, of retirement. Jack, when you present that to 20 year olds, does it resonate? It, it does. I have a, I have a, I have software. You know, when I first came to LaSalle, it was I was a chalk and talk teacher. Green blackboards and yellow chalk. Now we have internet. We have software applications, and there are certain models I can show them the dramatic effect if they don't do things now. What the impact is before they retire, and it's staggering, and it gets their attention. Wow, I could imagine. Yeah, yeah. when somebody's yeah, hopefully it gets their attention. Hopefully, yeah, <laughs> and, they, and they're going to act on it too. Yes. Um, yes. Um, in, in addition to, to working with, with the students, you, you said you're active in, in various research. What, what other areas have you, have you looked at um, that well, folks at home might benefit from, oh, from, you mean an, from an advisor? As, yeah. far as, it, as far as the publishing that I do? Yeah. Well, the last, for the last uh, seven years, it's all been pretty much retirement planning. Uh, my, our, our youngest daughter, who's an attorney, and I wrote an article on tax education benefits for tax, for education. Um, but most of it has been retirement planning, how to accumulate money, allocate assets, use annuities, uh, and now, now what the cost of what will be in retirement. So that's what I'm trying to convey. And, I, and, the, stu and the students, I've, I put the articles out there for them to read, and I tell them, you've got to read this stuff now. Yeah. Now, with, with recent changes, say, in health care, yes. uh, so-called Obamacare, yes. uh, Affordable Care Act, yes. Has that, are you able to factor that in yet, it's or is that early. still to be determined? It's a little early, Joe, but what, what I do have is data from, from uh, the site of actuaries, uh, the, uh, the retirement uh, planning center in Boston College, uh, of showing what the health care costs are at the end of someone's life, and they're, they're staggering right now. What, uh, they can only get, to me, they can only get worse, I would think. I, see, I guess especially if we live longer, yes. and then those maladies towards the end of life that are right. much more costly if someone has Alzheimer's or exactly. needs a nursing home or something along that line. Exactly. The life expectancy is a lot longer than people think uh, uh, for, for a lot of couples, and I have, I have data on that. I don't have it right with me, but uh, it's, it's, it's 30 years. Well, yeah. I guess that's, yeah, that's good news is <laughs> yeah, I'm right. starting to get up there, uh, <laughs> we all but, but we've got to make sure right. we're saving for it. Exactly, them. right. Yeah. Most important. The other area that must present a challenge, Jack, is changes in the tax code. Yes. Uh, which I guess gets updated every year. Um, but when you see those significant changes and, and you're kind of rewriting textbooks and rewriting right. the approach with students, right. um, how, how up to date do you have to be in terms of your research and how does that translate into the classroom? Uh, probably every day I get a tax update uh, email from one of the services that we use in our accounting firm. At plus, I'll just go to conferences, plus I have to take 40 credits every year in, in CPE to keep my, up my CPE license, um, and 16 of those are in tax. But I spend a lot of time reading uh, articles and just, just staying current, and you have to stay current. It's so vast, that information is just so broad, but um, you just have to stay current. It's just a matter of updating yourself continually. Is there an area that uh, the general public doesn't know about that you would recommend they keep an eye on is there as that tax mm. date starts to approach? Uh, well, uh, they, it depends on the level. A lot of the, the recent ch changes were directed towards people above a certain income level, certain okay. AGI. Uh, that will probably exclude 99% of the folks out there. But uh, if you are, if it's a working couple, both professionals, both making money, then you may want to look at things like net investment income tax, which will be there, a phase out of itemized deductions, things that were in the code, went out of the code, and, and now they're put back in. Okay. All so revenue ra raising measures. All changing all the time. Right. And, and to what extent um, do you see politics playing a role? I mean, you know, is it, it depends on who's in the White House or who's controlling the, right. the Congress? Right. And it depends upon the economy and whether we're trying to boost the economy, as Ronald Reagan did in, in 81 and 86, uh, major changes that, that brought us out of it, brought us a big recovery. Uh, even changes in reducing or keeping the tax rates reduced after 2008, after the Great Recession. Uh, it has a, a big play on that. You, you've got two, two angles. One, you're trying to keep the economy going, and two, you're trying to pay for the government. So those are, those are they're in, in direct opposition to one another. Um, we've only got a couple minutes left, Jack. If you were looking into a crystal ball in terms of where the economy going or government policy is going, would mm. any, any sense, or is there, is there enough gridlock in Washington that... <laughs> 
things won't get done. Yeah, the f well, sometimes somebody, someone said it's better if, if nothing gets done, but uh, I, I, it's really hard to predict. If I could predict that, I, I would make a big bet on the stock market and, and, and you, you know, know which way to go. have a party, right, right exactly. <laughs> Uh, well, what's next uh, in terms of research? Is it just retirement planning? and Pretty much. I'm looking for angles that, uh, that can help people and, and help practitioners in the CPA field that uh, are looking and doing financial planning. And uh, it, I find it very interesting. And you have this baby boomer generation, uh, people born between 1946 and 1964, 80 million of them, all need planning, all need ideas, uh, all need to look to the future. And, uh, and uh, so that's that keeps me busy. So we'll keep, yeah, quite busy yes. as, uh, as that generation uh, is in starting to retire right. and right. starting to, to, to think about it. So right. Right. Um, and it, it's incumbent upon the younger generation, the millennials, the people that are just that are in this, in this uh, coming into b being now that need to do the, the greater planning because they won't have the safety nets that we have right now. Yeah, I guess the future of even something like Social Security exactly. is uh, yes. in doubt. Yes, um, it's, it's uh, in the words of the trustees of Social Security Administration, it's unsustainable in its current form. Okay. okay. All right. Well, on that bright note. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Joe. <laughs> Jack Lynn, but I appreciate you uh, on the program. My pleasure. Thanks for having okay. me. My guest has been Jack Zook, who is a professor in our Department of Accounting here at LaSalle University. Once again, my name is Joe Marbach, and I'm the provost at LaSalle. Thank you for watching.